Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by, and welcome to the introduction to cooperative webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Should you wish to ask a question during the presentation, please use the chat feature located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press star zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded October the 7th, 2015. I would now like to turn the conference over to Margaret Bow, Cooperative Development Specialist with USDA Rural Development. Go ahead, Margaret. I mean, excuse me. Hello, everyone. Happy Co-op Month. Thank you for joining our webinar series, the first of which will be an introduction to cooperatives. So without further ado, let's define what exactly is a cooperative. A cooperative is a business but it's a business that is unique. It's owned and democratically controlled by the people that use the services of that cooperative business. So at USDA, we like to highlight three hallmarks of a cooperative. Number one, it's owned by the members of the cooperative. Number two, it's controlled by the members, one member, one vote regardless of how much business they do through the cooperative or regardless of how much they have invested in the cooperative. And the third hallmark of a cooperative is that the benefits go back to the member owners based on how much they have used the cooperative. It's not for the benefit of the investors. Co-ops operate at cost and operate for the aspirations of the members, whatever they are interested in. So with that bit of background, let's talk a little bit about why co-ops tend to be organized, why they are formed. Uh, historically, it has tended to be a defensive strategy. People would come together and form cooperative businesses to meet some type of unmet social or economic need or else they would come together to, to address some type of market imbalance that was going on, some type of market failure. But nowadays, more and more people are organizing cooperatives or becoming members of cooperatives for proactive reasons. They're interested in having true community ownership of, of their business. Uh, his, we have good data that shows that co-op businesses tend to last longer than conventional businesses. And a wonderful thing that we're very interested in at USDA Rural, Rural Development is that cooperatives create wealth for the members and wealth for the communities. So let's take a little moment and talk about historically, people have been cooperating since, since we have been human beings, obviously. That's how, we, that's how we've survived. Um, there is one particular co-op that was formed back in 1844 uh, in northern England during the depths of the start of the Industrial Revolution. It was a pretty miserable time as people were moving very rapidly from uh, cottage-based businesses in agricultural and rural areas, and they were very quickly being thrown into cities in pretty deplorable conditions. Uh, in northern England, people um, were, uh, there was one particular group in the small city of Rochdale outside of Manchester where people were being, um, people did not have a very good situation. So a group of mill workers came together and formed a consumer co-op so that they could get fresh uh, unadulterated flour and have access to good priced goods instead of a, uh, a company store. And that is not remarkable in and of itself, but what is remarkable is that they created a set of principles by which they governed their, their new cooperative businesses. And they created education and ongoing training for themselves uh, to provide literacy for themselves and good understanding so that they could, could work together and run a business together. And those principles that those pioneers came together to create in Rochdale is the precursor for what I'm going to talk about a little bit later about our cooperative principles. Um, cooperatives are worldwide. Uh, there's been some recent data uh, 
going to 2013, 2014 that was conducted by the United Nations that shows that out of 145 countries, there are 2.6 million cooperatives with over 1 billion people having membership in those cooperatives. That would be the equivalent to the fifth largest economy in the world if, if, a cooperative, if cooperatives were, banned, were pulled together and were considered one, one country. So that means that one out of every six people in the world has a cooperative membership. That's pretty astounding and that's pretty exciting. Let's talk about what it's like in the United States. Um, back in 2006 and then updated in 2009, the University of Wisconsin Center for Cooperative did a comprehensive overview of who is, what are cooperatives in the United States and how many are there and what is their economic impact. And as a result of that research, uh, partially funded by our agency, USDA Rural Development, they concluded that at that time, at a snapshot, 29,000, over 29,000 cooperatives exist. They did not include housing cooperatives. Uh, by far the most common type of cooperative are the consumer co-ops, and I'll, I will define that in just a moment. And then you can see there um, about 1,500 producer co-ops, shared services co-ops, and then uh, the worker co-ops. There are about 1.2 million families that reside in housing cooperatives. In the United States, we estimate there are about 350 million cooperative memberships. Um, obviously, there are more memberships than there are people in the United States. People belong, sometimes people belong to multiple cooperatives, and that's where that overlap would come. And the University of Wisconsin Center for Cooperatives estimates that about cooperatives account for about 650 $3 billion in revenue combining all of those cooperatives. So as you could tell, cooperatives are a pretty important part of our economy in the United States. Worth taking a look at. There are various types of cooperatives, and basically I would define that as by who owns and operate who owns the organizations, who are the member owners of those businesses. As shown in the statistics shared, to, shared with us by the University of Wisconsin Center for Cooperatives, the most common type of cooperative are the consumer co-ops. And then it's followed by producer co-ops, shared services co-ops, and then worker co-ops. And let's go ahead and define each of those so we better understand what we're talking about. Consumer co-ops. Examples of consumer co-ops, those would include credit unions. Those are cooperative financial institutions where the people that are using the services, people that are investing their money, people that are taking out loans, they are the member owners of those cooperative businesses. Uh, electric cooperatives. We have a very proud history in the United States of rural America receiving electrici electricity thanks to rural electric co-ops. We also have retail stores such as retail natural, natural food grocery stores. And then another type of cooperative that is a, relatively common in urban areas are the housing cooperatives. We also have a number of housing cooperatives uh, in the upper Midwest for people that are age 55 and over, as well as people living in manufactured housing. Consumer co-ops tend to operate at cost. They're all about providing good quality services at, at the minimal cost. Oftentimes to become a member owner of a cooperative, um, the equity requirement to join, how much, you would, how much it costs to join the cooperative is rather low. And then the return on investment that the members put in is, is rather minimal. Uh, because of that, sometimes people are excited when they form a consumer co-op, but over time uh, people tend to start to take electricity for granted. So there's high in interest enthusiasm a lot of times for consumer co-ops, but that can tend to wane over time. It doesn't have to be, but it, that tends to be what happens. So let's move on to the producer co-ops. 
Um, we're familiar with them. They tend to be the farmer co-ops. However, you could also have artisans coming together uh, producing art goods. They would be considered a producer co-op as well. And with a producer co-op, each individual member still is a small business owner, a small or medium-sized business owner. They retain their business. They are certainly oper managing and operating their own businesses. But those individual members come together to do something that they can't achieve individually. So they come together to do some joint processing or to in some way aggregate their product, to distribute it or to better market it so that the producers can better concentrate on what they do best, uh, growing good quality crops or producing wonderful artisan groups. And there's varied characteristics with producer co-ops uh, depending on how much money is needed to invest to start up that, that particular co-op, how active the members are in the life of their co-op, and also there's a great variety in the size of the cooperatives themselves. So let's move on to a, a type of cooperative that not many people are aware of, but it provides some pretty valuable services. And these are called shared services co-ops, also known as um, a buying club type of cooperatives. And the members of this, once again, are, can be small business owners. They can be individual nonprofits. And they could even be government agencies, local or state, county, local, state or county organizations coming together. So once again, each individual member retains ownership and control of their individual business, but they come together to do something jointly that they can't individually do alone. So they might come together for joint purchasing. Perhaps it might be for getting supplies, a uh, greater quantity of supplies at a lower price. Perhaps they come together to provide insurance for themselves. Perhaps it's the administrative or back office services that their businesses may need. Perhaps it's for contract negotiations. Uh, shared service co-ops could also provide marketing. They could be involved in distribution for their members. And they could also be involved in providing training for the members. And as, uh, as mentioned with some of the previous uh, examples, uh, equity requirements for shared services co-ops vary greatly depending on how much capital is needed to start up and operate that cooperative business. Member participation can vary greatly in, in how active they are in the life of their co-op. And also the size of the co-op can vary. Uh, I provided a picture there of Carpet One. Um, that is not a national franchise. Those are individual member businesses that have come together to form a cooperative. And those individual member businesses are able to, to survive in uh, some very tough uh, uh, market situations that uh, their individual members probably just wouldn't be able to survive. But coming together to do some joint purchasing, marketing, distribution, having a national ad campaign, they're able to survive and to do well. Another type of a cooperative I'd like to share with you, a very exciting a cooperative type and one that is gaining a lot of interest and activity in the United States are the worker cooperatives. And this is where the employees of the business are also the owners of that business. They, they are not only involved with day-to-day -day operations, but they are also involved and have ownership over the governance, setting the policies for their business. And worker co-ops make a lot of sense when labor, not capital, is key to providing good quality services. It would be ideal for knowledge industries. It's also ideal for service industries. For worker co-ops, there's much more involved with a worker co-op because this is a matter of people's individual livelihoods. This is, this is where they work. This is where they spend their time. So there is a lot of investment. There's a, a lot of activity. Uh, people actively participate in the life of their co-op. Um, 
There tends to be a lengthy pre-membership period if, if it's an established worker co-op for new people to join to become co-owners of that business. Uh, there would be some type of time requirement, perhaps three months, six months, a year, three years. And there would also be some substantial equity requirements. I like to call that pre-membership period as uh, kind of like co-op dating. It's an opportunity to figure out if, if the co-op is a good fit for me as an individual, and am I a, as an individual a good fit for the, the cooperative as well. What's neat about worker co-ops, it's a way to have shared entrepreneurship, to bring people together, to, bring, to, to acquire that synergy of ideas. Uh, worker co-ops are a wonderful way of reducing personal risk. It's a way for people to become owners without risking the shirt off their individual, individual back, pooling your resources and sharing in the risks and sharing in the rewards. Um, I heard a wonderful uh, co conversation about worker co-ops a while back in which in the United States we talk a lot about entrepreneurship. And a true entrepreneur um, oftentimes takes on a lot of risk. They're willing to risk the shirt off their back. They spend many hours a week engaged in starting up their business, oftentimes um, at the expense of family time, uh, at the expense of other life activities. And they are rewarded for that. But it's, it's a very hard lifestyle. There are actually more people that we would call enterprisers. And these are people that are very good at what they do. They enjoy what they're doing. They're used to working in groups. Uh, so much of what we do in the workplace is, is group-based activity. But they want to have a life. They want to spend time with their families. They want to grow a garden. So this is a way for people to come together, to own a business, to invest in a business, to have a say in the governance, and, and to have a balanced life that way. Another type of co-op that wasn't even uh, highlighted in the University of Wisconsin Center for Co-op study, this is a relatively new type of co-op in the United States. And it's what we call a hybrid or a multi-stakeholder co-op. And this is where two or more individual membership classes come together. In the United States, traditionally, we have had just consumer co-ops or just farmer co-ops. Well, this is where you would bring together both the consumers and the farmers. And historically, it has been thought that, that you couldn't have a co-op with both, both of those competing interests involved, that, that farmers would want to get the highest price possible for their product, and consumers would want to pay the lowest price possible for that product. Well, what we're finding is that for complex systems that require ongoing relationships, over time, that it makes more sense. People are not the sterile economic man trying to, to maximize their individual um, good. People are used to being in relationships, and there's a reciprocity going back. Uh, it's, it's relationship types of goods. And for things where you're trying to rebuild the local food system, or you're engaged in education or healthcare, you actually do need a variety of viewpoints. And you do have ongoing relationships with all the different stakeholders. Why not include those various stakeholders in the ownership and governance of, of that cooperative business? So there are a handful of multi-stakeholder cooperatives in the United States. We're tending to see most of that here with local foods. Uh, in Italy, where the multi-stakeholder cooperatives really originated back in 1991, it's more for social services that they come together. Very interesting that here in the States that it tends to be more around food. <clears throat> so with that background, sharing the different types of cooperatives based on who are the member owners of that, let's take a look at the different types of legal entities that one could form uh, for a business. And I group these into three major areas. Cooperative businesses, investor-owned, 
and then the nonprofit organizations. And if you compare who owns each one of those different types of structures with a cooperative, the ownership is all about the members. When it comes to investor-owned corporations such as C-Corps, uh, it's all about the investors. The investors are the owners of those businesses. And with a nonprofit, it's the community that owns that, loosely speaking. The legal purpose of a cooperative, it's about service to the members. For an investor-owned corporation, it's about making a return on investment. Hopefully, that corporation is providing good quality services. Hopefully they're treating their employees well. Hopefully they're being respectful of the environment. But when it comes down to it, it's all about making a return on investment. With a nonprofit organization, its primary goal is for some type of public benefit, education, a charitable purpose. With, when we look at governance, with the policy making, the policy setting of these different organizations. Each of these organizations are governed by a board of directors, but it differs as who makes up that board of directors. With a cooperative, it has to be from amongst the membership. Members vote from amongst themselves to elect a board of directors. With, a, with an investor-owned corporation, it's investors, and it's all about investors providing the governance. And then with the 501c3 nonprofit, community representatives, people that represent the wide variety of perspectives in the community will serve on the board. When it comes to the finances of these different organizations, it differs as well. Cooperatives, it's about member investment as well as earned income. When it comes to investor-owned corporations, it's all about the investors. And then with nonprofits, well, we know how that goes. <laughs> Grants, donations, fundraising, however you can tie it together. So let's move on. I wanted to share this slide with you I put together with data that comes out of the uh, Ministry of Economic Development, Innovation, and Export out of the province of Quebec in Canada. And since 1990, they have been tracking uh, very detailed data about cooperatives. And what they have found is that when you compare a cooperative business with the typical corporation, a typical conventional business in, in Quebec, Canada, five years down the road, cooperatives, those cooperatives are still in business 62% of the time, whereas the survival rate of corporations in Quebec is 35% five years out. When you double that, when you take it out 10 years, the survival rate for co-ops is 44%, whereas for the private sector, it's only 20%. And something interesting that they shared uh, that the province of Quebec, if, when they dig a little deeper into this data, they have found that those cooperatives that are well networked with other cooperatives and other industries, uh, other cooperatives in their particular industry, the survival rate goes up to 80 to 90 percent. So very interesting to think that in Quebec, the province is investing heavily in cooperative development because they see this as a powerful tool for business creation and for business survival. It's, it's, they're getting bang for their buck in Quebec. So I just provided a lot of background information what I'm going to share with you are seven cooperative principles to help us to further understand and define what are cooperatives. And I hearken back to the Rochdale pioneers back in 1844. They formed a, a consumer co-op, but they wrote, they put together a, a set of principles which they strive for. And 20 years ago, uh, there were a lot of conversations worldwide, and the International Cooperative Alliance redefined our cooperative principles. They actually added a seventh principle in 1995. So we have seven cooperative principles. And these are the principles that cooperatives everywhere strive for. So I'm going to go through these principles, and this will help us to better understand what's unique about cooperatives compared to other types of organizations. The first cooperative principle 
is voluntary and open membership, which means that membership is open to all individuals or organizations that are able and willing to accept the responsibilities of membership. Uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that a cooperative has to allow everyone in. It's based on what the market will bear. Uh, if the co-op is only able to market the goods of about 20 or 25 artisans, well, then they keep their membership a little bit closer, uh, uh, smaller. If they have the ability to market for 500 people, then they would open that membership up a little bit wider. Uh, here again, we get into what I call the co-op dating principle. Is the co-op a good fit for me? And I, am I a good fit for the co-op? What's very important is to provide meaningful information about membership. What are the duties, the responsibilities, and the rights of becoming a member? And then very common to include some type of pre-membership period, especially amongst the worker co-ops, for people to learn about, uh, to, under, to understand what it means to be a owner in a co-op, and, and for the other co-op members to get a good feel for is this person a good fit as well. Uh, the able and willing principle of volunteering open membership, you need to be sensitive to gender, social, racial, political, and or religious discrimination. Um, this doesn't allow people to discriminate on any, on, on, you know, in any way like that. It's all about what is a good fit. Let's move on to the second cooperative principle. And this is about democratic member control. As I mentioned before, one member, one vote. So people elect from amongst themselves, their fellow members, a board of directors. And the board of directors is empowered to, to set policy on behalf of the membership. In order to have good democratic control of a business that you're co-owning with a group of people, you need to have transparency, and you need to have it in such a way that you have fair decision making. You need to have good communication. Uh, this isn't a top-down approach of command and control. With a cooperative, people need to understand what's going on, to truly understand the financials, to, to understand what's going on in the market, and to feel that they have a voice uh, to participate. Let's. I'm putting. I threw this slide in here as an organizational chart of any cooperative, uh, be they large or small. It basically comes down to an inverted pyramid. The members are at the top. They are the reason for the existence of the cooperative. But if you've got a large co-op of 500 people, several hundred thousand people, it could be very difficult to set policy. So with all those members. So the members elect from amongst themselves a board of directors. And that board of directors is recognized by the state in which the co-op is incorporated as being fiscally responsible, as being responsible for that cooperative business. So you have a board of directors. It tends to be an odd number of people, although you wouldn't want odd people, but anyhow. And so the board of directors, they're engaged in policy setting. And then to to enact the policies and handle daily operations, oftentimes cooperative boards will hire a manager or an executive director, oftentimes it's called a manager, to handle the day-to-day -day operations. The manager will then hire any employees that the cooperative needs, and those employees will, re will uh, respond and report to the manager. The manager reports back to the board of directors, and the board of directors reports back to the membership. So think of an, the organizational chart of co-op as an inverted pyramid. So let's move on to the third cooperative principle, and this is about member economic participation. Remember with cooperatives, we are talking about businesses. And members contribute to and democratically control the capital involved with their business. And this is, this is kind of a, 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 a balance because with the profits in, in cooperatives, we tend to call that net margins, anything that's left over at the end of the year. You need to take that and you need to balance the needs of the co-op, building up reserves, uh, planning for the future, 
in case you need a new roof or you, in case you need to invest in new equipment, and balancing that with the need of the members to receive a return on investment for, for their participation uh, in the life of the cooperative. We call that in cooperatives patronage, uh, sharing in the, the economic participation, patronage. Um, anything, any money left over uh, net margins technically belongs to each member owner based on how much they've used it in the past year. Uh, you can have outside investments within the cooperative, but those investments are held at arm's length. People have no voting rights or very, very, very limited voting rights in the life of the cooperative just based on their investment. Again, a cooperative is about what's good for the membership. It's not about making a big return on investment. <clears throat> uh, since many of the people that are on this call are with USDA Rural Development, an agency that provides a lot of uh, loans and grants um, in, in rural America, I thought I'd spend a little bit of time talking about the capitalization of a cooperative. And uh, there are a number of options. Usually a cooperative will use a combination of, of what you see on the screen. Um, oftentimes members are asked to pay some type of equity fee. Uh, however, I've been cautioned by uh, accountants not to put the word fee in uh, because that uh, might not be considered um, an equity. Um, oftentimes it will be some type of transaction fee. Uh, traditionally, for farmer cooperatives, you have, we have something called per unit retains. And that's, that's where I'm from, Wisconsin. We tend to have a lot of dairy co-ops. Oftentimes, there will be a per unit retain on how many 100, 100 weight fluid uh, milk that you have processed through the cooperative. And the co-op will withhold 2% or 5% of that value to, to pay for the governance, to pay for the operations of, of the cooperative. Uh, with a worker co-op um, to help capitalize your co-op, especially initially, uh, there may be some type of hourly withholding, perhaps 50 cents um, uh, for every hour that you've worked. Um, that's just an example. That's an option that a co-op can use. Um, co-ops can also mount equity drives. And this is where cooperatives under state statutes are allowed to offer stock. They can offer either common stock, and this is the stock that everyone holds. They, they hold one common stock or whatever it's, it's defined as, and that just grants you the rights of membership. It's the same amount for everyone. Uh, then they could also offer preferred stock, and this is where we get involved with either members or people in the local community being able to invest in the cooperative but not having a policy say in the cooperative. Um, usually if, if a co-op offers preferred stock, I would recommend working with a, an attorney. Um, if you offer preferred stock to members or in the local community as long as it doesn't go beyond state boundaries, uh, usually uh, you are exempt from uh, from a filing with the Securities and Exchange Commission. And the reason for that, the Securities and Exchange Commission exists to provide um, transparency of everything that could possibly go wrong with a business. And that's why you have a great big one inch or three inch, um, three inch thick uh, document describing everything that could go wrong in the Securities and Exchange uh, release. Um, it's understood that with cooperatives, there's transparency, there's good communication. People are members, people are family members, people are in the community. They have some knowledge. They have some pretty in-depth knowledge of what's going on. You don't necessarily need the Securities and Exchange Commission to get involved. And once again, very limited voting rights. Uh, for instance, in, in the state of Wisconsin where I'm involved in, um, People that hold stock have limited voting rights in the case, cases of merger, acquisition, dissolution, those types of major, major life events in that business in which they would be uh, directly uh, touched upon. But when it comes to having a voice and who serves on the board, no. Um, that, that's um, two different things. Um, other capital 
options include subsidized loans and grants. Uh, perhaps there might be some loans from individual members, people that, that are in a position and they, they want to step forward and provide a little more capital uh, to their cooperative. And then you could also uh, certainly go outside and uh, go towards commercial rate loans. Uh, I would like to note that with cooperatives, these are businesses, and you don't want to become grant dependent. It's appropriate to be in, to receive grants in the formation of the cooperative. It's appropriate for co-op development centers, which are nonprofit organizations that are actively engaged in providing technical assistance and helping people across uh, rural America form cooperatives. It's very appropriate for them to receive um, grants to operate and to provide services uh, to people to form cooperatives. Um, it would be appropriate if, um, if your particular co-op business uh, is in uh, value-added agriculture and you wanted to apply for a value-added producer grant through USDA Rural Development, great for you, but you want to try to minimize reliance on those grants. These are businesses, uh, co-ops are all about self-reliance and sustainability, and grants for business is not a way to be sustainable. Okay, thank you for allowing me to go off on that little detour, uh, a little deeper into capitalization of co-op. Let's move on to the fourth co-op principle, and this is autonomy and independence. And what this means is that when, when a co-op is entering into contracts or any type of financial arrangements, you need to do so on terms that maintain that democratic control by the member owners. Um, you would ideally, it would be you would like to have co-ops that the board of directors or individual members don't have to enter uh, to take out personal loans or to have personal signatures on the loans that the co-op takes out. I do realize that in the case of starting new cooperatives, those are new businesses. They may be viewed as risky by lenders. Uh, they may try to ask for personal signatures from some of the members of the co-op, but we try to avoid that. And in fact, uh, we have several financial institutions that understand cooperatives such as National Cooperative Bank, uh, the Ag Credit System, that understand the needs of cooperatives and respect this. So I just wanted to throw that out. Um, oftentimes this principle is brought out uh, as a contrast to what was going on uh, in the former Soviet Union days um, or in, in the Iron Curtain. Uh, oftentimes people were agricultural as collectivized and those were called cooperatives. Well, there was not autonomy and independence. So that's, that's a misnomer to call those particular organizations cooperatives. So let's move on to the fifth cooperative principle, which is education, training, and information. If you're going to co-own a business together, you need to understand the basics of the financials. You need to be able to understand the financial statements. And you need some basic understanding of how to participate in a democratic process. Uh, another important aspect is to educate the public about cooperatives. Unfortunately, even though we have, as, as the University of Wisconsin Center for Co-ops shared with us, we have a lot of reach, but it's still one of the best kept secrets in America. Sixth cooperative principle is cooperation amongst co-ops, and oftentimes more established co-ops will help out uh, in the formation of newer co-ops, uh, realizing that when we share information, we're paying it forward. Someone that previously helped you, you, you got going, and you're going to help out another cooperative into the future. Uh, so it's what you'll often find. I, I have the logos of several co-ops there that were involved in the formation of a uh, uh, a local food hub cooperative called the Fifth Season Co-op in Southwest Wisconsin, and involved in that was. Um, a 100-year-old dairy cooperative, Organic Valley Cooperative, uh, the local credit union, and the local uh, uh, natural food grocery store cooperative. Providing expertise help, um, it's a wonderful way to, to pay it forward. And then the final cooperative principle is a concern for community. Co-ops are very much rooted in community. It's all about sustainability 
And uh, a couple years ago I had the opportunity to really dig into the state statutes uh, on cooperatives here in the state that I reside in. And I was just amazed that our state statutes that go back to the 1920s, they were talking about the triple bottom line, just the way that the, the statutes were written long before it became financially, or long before it became uh, rather vogue uh, in, in the common media. Uh, Co-ops are about the financial viability. These are businesses. It's all about member interests. And there's also concern about the environment and the community as a whole. The International Cooperative Alliance also has defined a number of values that we in the co-op field all you know, try to aspire towards. And if you look at those cooperative values, it's, it's interesting. We have values that are self-help, self-responsibility. Uh, we also include values of democracy, equality, equity, and solidarity. And if you look at those words, uh, politically, that runs the gamut. Uh, you may have more conservative people that may say, oh, look at that, self-help, self-responsibility. And you may have more liberal or progressive-leaning people that say, hey, look at that, it's about solidarity and equity. It's all there. Cooperatives cross political boundaries. It's all about, it's, it's, it really is a way to come together. And then ethical values, this reflects the need for good communication and transparency that honesty, openness, social responsibility, and caring for others. So I have talked for at least 40 minutes. I could go on for hours. But uh, why don't we stop here and uh, see if there are any questions. Let's see here. Okay, and I'm not sure if Andres is on the line. He was going to help me with the chat, chat box to see if um, there are any questions. I am on the line, Margaret. Okay, thank you. Uh, the only questions uh, we've received so far uh, via the chat, uh, two different individuals asked um, about the availability of this webinar after um, after everything's over, one about the recording of the webinar, and another asked if the present the PowerPoint presentation will be available. Okay, I believe yes, this is being recorded. In fact, it's being um, um, uh, transcribed as well. Uh, we will have that information available. I don't have the details on that, but but we will make this available, and the PowerPoint slide should be available as well. All right, uh, and just to expand on that, uh, we will have a uh, video of the presentation with audio, um, a transcription of everything that was said, and the presentation itself should be available. All right, uh, questions are starting to come in now. Okay, the first great. question, I'm, introduce, I'm interested in the possibility of a fishing producer co-op. Can you speak to any examples? Oh, very good question. Um, actually, there are uh, several of those. Um, I can think of some in um, Alaska, uh, especially some Native American, or excuse me, Native Alaskan groups have come together uh, to cooperatively uh, fish, well, actually to, to uh, uh, market their fish. I do believe there is a new cooperative I just read about um, in the northeast part of the country, I believe in Maine. It's the Land and Sea Cooperative. Um, so there are several examples across the country. Um, obviously, it tends to be coastal examples. Um, could do a little digging into that, and I would certainly be glad to uh, put you in contact with some good organizations that could help you with that. All right. Um, next, uh, where does a cooperative school fit in the big picture? Um, I'm not sure what is meant by a cooperative school. Um, there are several uh, preschools that are cooperatively owned. I have seen variations on the theme. I've seen three variations on the theme of a preschool co-op. I have seen a parent, uh, what would be considered a consumer-owned cooperative where the parents of uh, the students, the, the small children that are attending there, 
uh, cooperatively own the daycare or the preschool. I've also seen wor uh, worker co-ops of preschools. There's a very famous example in, uh, um, in Pennsylvania, um, Philadelphia, yes. Um, uh, there are three worker-owned uh, daycare co-ops in Philadelphia. And then you could also have a uh, preschool co-op that is owned, for instance, if you have a business park and a number of businesses go together and those businesses, so like six or seven businesses, will co-own a preschool so that they can provide that as a benefit uh, to their employees. Um, or you could do a combination. I, I could certainly see a combination of a worker slash consumer cooperative. Uh, when it comes to preschools, oftentimes uh, parents are involved for six, seven years, and then once their children move on, um, they're no longer interested in membership and, and being active in the co-op. Uh, so it would be interesting to have a co-op in which you have employees where you have the daycare providers uh, being involved as well as the parents. Um, I'm trying to think of other examples. In, in Mondragon, Spain, in, in, in northern Spain in the Basque region, there is a university that is cooperatively owned. And the members, they have three membership classes, the students, the teachers, and the business community. Very interesting. Um, so I, I think I, I think I addressed that. Amy, uh, I believe that question came from Amy Cavanaugh. We could, we could talk offline at another time. All right. Uh, the next question, <clears throat> can you talk more about some of your success stories uh, that have impressed you over your career? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, we have, um, there's a co-op I've been involved in for, uh, oh goodness, 15, 16 years now. Uh, it's called Cooperative Care. And this is a worker co-op of home care providers. These are primarily women. They do have about four men in the co-op, but they're it's primarily women going into the homes of the elderly and people with disabilities to help them get ready for the day, to, uh, to bathe, cook, clean, uh, toileting, all that type of good things. Anything that keeps a person independent and living in their own home rather than living in an assisted living facility or a nursing home. Um, if you know anything about that industry, uh, the pay is very low. It averages about eight and a half, nine bucks an hour. Um, very few benefits. Uh, it's very difficult to piece together a full-time work because everyone wants to get uh, needs caregiving early in the morning or later at night. Uh, the nature of the work. Um, people go into the hospital. People. Um, pass away. So it's difficult to have regular hours. Um, this particular group of women came together and formed a worker co-op. Uh, they called themselves Cooperative Care. Uh, they've been in operation since 2001. And um, as a result, because they own the business, they set the policies. Um, they are able to pay themselves about a dollar to two dollars an hour more than the going rate in that industry. Um, they have provided, initially they provided for themselves health insurance, although that went away a couple years ago. They provide themselves paid sick leave, um, vaca paid vacation time, um, and they also share in patronage refunds. Any profits at the end of the year, they share amongst themselves based on how often they worked in the previous year. So for um, so over the life of that cooperative, the patronage refunds have uh, varied from zero in any particular year. A couple years ago they were having a tough time. And in really good years they've paid a do an extra dollar fifty-seven an hour for every hour worked. Uh, so sharing in the, um, the profits of that, of that. I'm going to talk about this particular co-op in a little more detail next week. But uh, uh, what has been exciting is that um, there are very few quality measures for home care. The only quality measure universally accepted is the turnover rate, how, um, how long employees stay with that business. Um, and in the industry, it's anywhere from 60%, 60 to 100% turnover every single year. As you can imagine, that's very disruptive to the lives of 
elders and people with disabilities to constantly having an influx of people coming into your own home and providing the most intimate of care. Uh, but with cooperative care and with similar home care worker co-ops, uh, the turnover rate, um, very conservatively speaking, is about 20%. It's oftentimes 10 to 15% per year. So it's, it's a win-win-win. It's a win for the caregivers. It's a win for the people receiving the care. And it's a win for, for the community, knowing that uh, there's good quality care available. So I could go on for hours about home care worker co-ops, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll refrain from that. Thanks for the question. All right. Uh, the next question, what role do you see cooperatives playing in rural environments, and how does this differ from urban communities? Oh, very good question. Um, we need cooperatives in urban areas as well. Um, we have tended to see, um, just because cooperatives initially often are agricultural, well, agricultural cooperatives are often historically were created and then we started to see financial cooperatives and then you would see shared services co-ops and you would see consumer co-ops and then you would see a progression to worker co-ops. Um, that's historically how co-op development tends to go in countries around the world, start out with ag. And so agriculture obviously is tends to be more in rural areas, and that's why we have seen more cooperatives in rural areas. But we are seeing a, um, a wonderful interest in cooperatives in urban areas. And in fact, a number of municipalities, um, a number of cities, uh, mayors are using the co-op development strategy as an economic development strategy. And for instance, New York City in Madison, um, Madison, Wisconsin, um, city councils are actually investing money into co-op development as an economic development strategy. So, so we should be seeing more activity in urban areas. All right. Uh, the next question, mm -hmm. uh, how helpful is it to read USDA's Rural Cooperatives Magazine on a regular basis to keep track of co-op trends? I think it's a very, yeah, <laughs> I think it's a wonderful idea. Um, we are fortunate. Uh, USDA Rural Development publishes, it has, it has published for over 80 years uh, what is now called Rural Cooperatives Magazine. And it is a wonderful, uh, you hear some wonderful stories. It, it covers the whole range of different types of cooperatives, uh, be they traditional a conventional agricultural cooperatives, be they up and coming co-op development uh, uh, activities, uh, be they worker co-ops, be they shared services co-ops. It's, it's a really fine publication um, and it's beautifully laid out. It's a uh, nice glossy print. Um, I believe it, the circulation is about 17,000 people uh, receiving a hard copy, but it's certainly accessible on the internet as well. So yeah. I do read the magazine. It's a, it's, it's a lovely magazine. All right. Uh, the next question, what would you say are the greatest challenges facing a multi-stakeholder mm -hmm. co-op? Mm -hmm. And how might a co-op address those yeah. challenges? Yes, very good question. Um, as I mentioned, the multi-stakeholder co-op, that's a relatively new model here in the United States, although it's been around since 1991 in Italy, and it is the most common type of structure used in co-op development now in Quebec, Canada. Um, I've, I've been involved in forming five multi-stakeholder co-ops uh, personally here in the state of Wisconsin and, and have advised on other multi-stakeholder co-ops in the country. And one of my concerns is that oftentimes people go into nonprofit mode thinking and I'm afraid that some people may confuse a multi-stakeholder multi cooperative with a nonprofit. Um, because it oftentimes a nonprofit on their board will have representation from various aspects of the community. Um, and with a multi-stakeholder, obviously on your board you, you will have representatives of the consumers or, or the workers or what have you. Um, but you need to keep clear that um, cooperatives are businesses. Um, and nonprofits have a very important role in, in our uh, communities cooperative businesses do as well. So I'm, I'm a little concerned about that mission creep and, and that kind of that creep into thinking about uh, thinking 
um, people that they've got a nonprofit mission. Um, another thing to, to keep in mind is that um, one of the wonderful things with the multi-stakeholder co-op is that you get a multiple, multiple points of view from everyone that's going to be consuming the product to producing the product or, or service or what have you. Um, making sure to have good balance on your board. Um, oftentimes employees of a cooperative, and let's say that a multi-stakeholder co-op has a worker ownership membership, um, oftentimes they are privy to a lot more information than consumers would. So you may need to balance that a bit on the board composition. You may need to have double the amount of consumers versus workers or, or something like that. Um, so there's, there's a couple um, things to think through structurally. Uh, if you're working, if, if I'm if anyone's involved in forming a multi-stakeholder co-op, uh, you probably knew, need to spend a little more due diligence thinking through the structure than you would with other types of co-ops. All right, and we've got uh, two more questions. I'm going to go ahead and read both, and we've only got five minutes left. Um, uh, can you discuss technical assistance providers that can assist with the creation of co-ops? Mm -hmm. And then um, aside from the mechanics of RCDG application process, mm -hmm. what are the best ways that USDA state staff and co-op development centers can work together to service co-ops? Oh my goodness. Oh, <laughs> very good question. Um, well, um, I'll, I'll touch upon that first question, discuss technical assistance providers. Um, we are fortunate in the United States. We have a number of nonprofit or university associated co-op development centers. Um, there are at least 30 of those co-op development centers across the country. Um, some serve one state, some serve multiple states, some will serve a geographic area of a state. Uh, then we also have some co-op, and, and those types of co-op development centers tend to be generalist. They will help out in any type of cooperative, be it agriculture, be it worker co-ops, what have you. But then we also are seeing a rise, uh, kind of a trend amongst co-op development, where we have some co-op development centers that are specializing in a particular industry. Uh, they may have a national scope. For instance, um, based out of Minnesota, we have something called the Food Cooperative Initiative. And that particular co-op development center, they are the national experts when it comes to trying to start a retail natural food grocery co-op. And so when I get phone calls and it's about some type of retail food, I immediately send them to their website. They've got wonderful materials there, and they have wonderful resources to help people go through that process. Uh, we have a wonderful organization uh, called uh, the Democracy at Work Institute. It's affiliated with the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops, and they are the specialists when it comes to helping to form worker co-ops. Um, so it's, it's fascinating. With the co-op development centers, we have generalists, and then we are also starting to see some specialization. So uh, we're fortunate we've got some of those resources. Um, then there was the question about, aside from the mechanics of the uh, Rural Cooperative Development Grant application, which is funding from USDA Rural Development to support uh, those nonprofit co-op development centers across the country, what are some other ways that um, USDA staff can, can support uh, co-op development centers. Um, it needs, to, I, I, would, I would highly suggest uh, both USDA sta uh, state level people as well as the co-op development centers become acquainted with one another, meet with each other on a regular basis uh, because it's very important for USDA folks to be aware of, hey, what's going on? What type of co-op development? What kind of interests are you seeing across our region? And um, 
you know, are there resources that we at USDA can help out with some of these projects? You know, perhaps you're working with a group that could benefit from a value-added producer grant. Or perhaps we could put you in touch with one of our sister agencies uh, that might help out with high tunnel um, grants and loans, that type of thing. Uh, so it really needs to be an open communication. There is, there's, um, each organization is seeing things on the ground and sharing that information. Um, for good co-op development and good support to co-ops. All right. Well, we have not received any other questions over chat, so I think that's Right, right. Well, I certainly appreciate your attentiveness. Uh, it looks like we had about 57 people on this call uh, today. And next week we have another webinar uh, set up for the same time. Uh, that topic will be using the cooperative model to build capacity in high poverty rural communities. Uh, so this will be an area um, I've been thinking about quite a bit. I'm looking forward to sharing some information, and I'm looking forward to some, uh, some good questions that hopefully we can uh, dig into. So uh, thank you for that. And I look forward to, to talking more and uh, interacting with you next week. And our, um, also on Wednesday the 21st, we have a third webinar in this series called What Do Cooperatives Have to Do with Rural Development? We'll dig a little bit more into that. And then the fourth in this series will be hosted by Jim Barham on Friday, October 30th. Uh, we have an initiative at USDA called Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food. Well, he's adding to that, Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food, Know Your Cooperative. And it's going to be about local food co-ops. So uh, thank you for your attention, and I look forward to, to chatting with you some more next week.